This is chapter 13 of the Wee Freeman, Land Under Wave. <clears throat> the queen walked over the turf toward Tiffany, where she'd trodden frost gleamed for a moment. The little part of Tiffany that was still thinking thought, that grass will be dead by the morning. She's killing my turf. The whole of life is but a dream when you come to think of it, said the queen in that same infuriatingly calm, pleasant voice. She sat down on the fallen stones. You humans are such dreamers. You dream that you're clever. You dream that you're important. You dream that you're special. You know, you're almost better than the drones. You're certainly more imaginative. I have to thank you for that. What for? said Tiffany, looking at her boots. Terror clamped her body in red-hot wires. There was nowhere to run. I never realized how wonderful your world is, said the queen. I mean, the drones, well, they're just not much more than some kind of walking sponge, really. Their world is ancient. It's nearly dead. They're not really creative anymore. With a little help from me, now you people could be a lot better. Because, you see, you dream all the time. Now you especially dream all the time. Your picture of the world is a landscape with you in the middle of it, isn't it? Wonderful. Now look at you in that rather horrible dress and those clumpy boots. You dreamed that you could invade my world with a frying pan. You had this dream about brave girl rescuing little brother. You thought you were the heroine of a story. And then you left him behind. You know, I think being hit by a billion tons of seawater must be like having a mountain of iron drop on your head, don't you? Tiffany couldn't think. Her head was full of hot pink fog. It hadn't worked. Her third thoughts were somewhere in that fog, trying to make themselves heard. Got Roland out, she muttered, still staring at her boots. But he's not yours, said the queen. He is, let us face it, a rather stupid boy with a big red face and brains made out of pork, just like his father. You left your little brother behind with a bunch of little thieves and you instead rescued a spoiled little fool. There was no time, Tiffany's third thought shrieked. You wouldn't have gotten him and gotten back to the lighthouse. You nearly didn't get away as it is. You got Roland out, and that was the logical thing to do. You don't have to feel guilty about that. What's better, to try and save your brother and be brave, courageous, stupid, oh, and dead, or save the boy and be brave, courageous, sensible, and alive? But something kept saying that stupid and dead would have been more right. Something kept saying, would you say to mom that you could see that there wasn't time to rescue your brother so you rescued someone else instead? Would she be pleased that it all worked out? Being right doesn't always work. It's the queen, yelled her third thoughts. It's her voice. It's like hypnotism. You have to stop listening. Well, I expect it's not your fault that you're so cold and heartless, said the queen. It's probably all to do with your parents. They probably never gave you enough time, and, well, having Wentworth was a very cruel thing to do. You really should have been more careful. And they let you read too many books. It just can't be good for a young brain, knowing words like paradigm and eschatological. It leads to behavior such as using your brother as monster bait, said the queen, and she sighed. Sadly, that sort of thing happens all the time. I think you should just be proud of not being worse than just a deeply introverted and socially maladjusted person. And she walked around Tiffany. It's so sad, she continued. You dream that you're strong and sensible, loyal, the kind of person who always has a bit of string. But that's just your excuse for not being really properly human. You're just a brain, 
no heart at all. You didn't even cry when Granny Aching died. You think too much, and now your precious thinking has let you down. Well, I think it would be best if you just died. Now, don't you? Find a stone, her third thought screamed. Hit her. Tiffany was aware of other figures in the gloom. There were some of the people from the summer pictures, but there were also drones and the headless horsemen and the bumblebee women. Around her, frost crept over the ground. I think we'll like it here, said the queen. Tiffany felt the cold creeping up her legs, and her third thoughts, hoarse with effort, shouted, Do something! She should have been better organized, she, shot, she thought dully. She shouldn't have relied on dreams. Or perhaps I should have just been a real human being, more feeling. But I couldn't help not crying. It just wouldn't come. And how can I stop thinking and thinking and thinking and then thinking about thinking and thinking? And she saw a smile in the queen's eyes and then thought, which one of all those people doing all of that thinking is me? Is there really any me at all? Clouds poured across the sky like a stain. They covered the stars. They were the inky clouds from the frozen world, the clouds of a nightmare. It began to rain, rain that had ice in it. It hit the turf like bullets, turning it into chalky mud. The wind howled like a pack of grim hounds. Tiffany managed to take a step forward. The mud sucked at her boots. Oh, a little bit of spirit at last, said the queen, stepping back. Tiffany tried another step, but things just weren't working anymore. She was too tired and cold. She could feel herself disappearing, getting lost. Mm, it's so sad to see it ending all like this, said the queen. Tiffany fell forward into the freezing mud. The rain grew harder, stinging like needles, hammering on her head and running like icy tears down her cheeks. It struck so hard, it left her breathless. She felt the cold drawing all the heat out of her, and that was the only sensation left, apart from a musical note. It sounded like the smell of snow or the sparkle of frost. It was high and thin and drawn out. She couldn't feel the ground underneath of her. There was nothing to see, not even the stars. The clouds had covered everything. She was so cold. She couldn't even feel the cold anymore, or her fingers. A thought managed to trickle through her freezing mind. Is there any me at all? Or do my thoughts just dream of me? The blackness grew deeper. Night was never as black as this, and winter never as cold. It was colder than the deep winters when the snow came down and Granny Aching would plod from snowdrift to snowdrift, looking for warm bodies. The sheep could survive the snow if the shepherd had some wits, Granny used to say. The snow kept the cold away and the sheep shivering in warm hollows under the roofs of snow, snow while bitter wind blew harmlessly over them. But this was as cold as those days when even the snow couldn't fall and the wind was pure cold itself, blowing ice crystals across the turf. Those were the killer days in early spring, when the lambing had begun and winter came howling down one more time. There was a darkness everywhere, bitter and starless, and there was a speck of light a very long way off. One star, low down, moving. It got bigger as it got in the stormy night, and it zigzagged as it came. Silence covered Tiffany, and she drew into herself, and the silence smelled like sheep and turpentine and tobacco. And then the movement came, as if she was falling through the ground very fast, and gentle warmth, and just for a moment the sound of the waves, and her own voice inside her head. This land is in my bones land under wave and whiteness <clears throat> and she tumbled through the warm heavy darkness around her something like snow but as fine as dust 
It piled up somewhere below her because she could see a faint whiteness. A creature, like an ice cream cone with lots of tentacles, shot past her and jetted away. Oh, I'm underwater, thought Tiffany. I remember. This is the million-year rain under the sea, this new land being born underneath an ocean. It's not a dream. It's a memory. The land under wave, millions and millions of tiny shells. The land was alive. All the time there was this warm, comforting smell of the shepherding hut and this feeling of being held in invisible hands. The whiteness below her rose up and over her head, but it didn't seem uncomfortable. It was like being in a mist. Now I'm inside the chalk, like flint, like caulking. She wasn't sure how long she spent in the warm, deep water, or if indeed any time really had passed, or if the millions of years went past in a second, but she felt the movement again and a sense of rising. More memories poured into her mind. There's always been someone watching the borders. They didn't decide to, it was decided for them. Someone has to care. Sometimes they have to fight. Someone has to speak for those that have no voice. She opened her eyes. She was still lying in the mud and the queen was laughing at her. And overhead, a storm raged, but she felt warm. In fact, she felt hot, red hot with anger. Anger at the bruised turf, anger at her own stupidity, anger at this beautiful creature whose only talent was control. This creature was trying to take her world. All witches are selfish, the queen had said, but Tiffany's third thought said, then turn selfishness into a weapon. Make all the things yours. Make other lives and dreams and hopes yours. You protect them. You save them. Bring them into the sheepfold. Walk the gale for them. Keep away the wolf. They're my dreams and my brother, my family, my land, my world. And how dare you try to take these things because they are mine. I have a duty. The anger overflowed. She stood up, clenching her fists and screamed at the storm, putting into her scream all the rage that was inside of her. Lightning struck the ground on either side of her. It did so twice. And it stayed there, crackling, and two dogs formed. Steam rose from their coats, and blue light sparked from their ears as they shook themselves. They looked attentively at Tiffany. The queen gasped and vanished. Come by, lightning, shouted Tiffany. Away to me, thunder! and she remembered the time when she'd run across the downs, falling over, shouting out all the wrong things, while the two dogs had done exactly what needed to be done. Two streaks of black and white sped away across the turf and up toward the clouds. They herded the storm. Clouds panicked and scattered, but always there was a comet streaking across the sky and they were turned. Monstrous shapes writhed and screamed in the boiling sky, but thunder and lightning had worked many flocks. There was an occasional snap of lightning spark teeth and a little wail. Tiffany stared upward, rain pouring off her face, and she shouted commands that no dog could have possibly heard. Jostling and rumbling and screaming, the storm rolled off the hills and away toward the mountains, where there were deep canyons that could panic. Out of breath, and glowing with triumph, Tiffany watched until the dogs came back and settled once again on the turf. And then she remembered something else. It didn't matter what orders she gave those dogs. They were not her dogs. They were working dogs. Thunder and lightning didn't take orders from a little girl. The dogs weren't looking at her. They were looking just behind her. She'd have turned if someone had told her that a horrible monster was behind her. Well, she would have turned if they'd said it had a thousand teeth. She didn't want to turn around now, though. Forcing herself to do so was the hardest thing she had ever done. She was not afraid of what she might see. She was terribly, mortally frightened, afraid to the center of her bones of what she might not see. 
She shut her eyes while her cowardly boots shuffled her around. And then after a deep breath, she opened them again. <clears throat> there was a gust of jolly sailor tobacco and sheep and turpentine. And sparkling in the dark, light glittering off the white shepherdess dress and every blue ribbon and silver buckle of it was granny aching, smiling hugely, radiant with pride. In one hand, she held the huge ornamental crook hung with blue bows. She pirouetted slowly, and Tiffany saw that while she was brilliant, sparkling shepherdess from hat to hem, she still had on her huge old boots. Granny Aching took her pipe out of her mouth and gave Tiffany a little nod that was, from her, a round of applause. And then she just wasn't. Real starlit darkness covered the turf, and the nighttime sounds filled the air. Tiffany didn't know if what had just happened was a dream, or happened somewhere that wasn't quite here, or it happened only in her head. But that didn't matter. It happened. And now... But I'm still here, said the queen, stepping in front of her. Well, perhaps it was all a dream. Perhaps you have gone just a little mad, because you are, after all, a very strange child. Perhaps you had help. I mean, how good are you? Do you really think that you can face me all alone? I can make you think whatever I please. Cravens! Oh, not them, the queen said, throwing up her hands. It wasn't just the Knack McFeagle, but also Wentworth, the very strong smell of seaweed, a whole lot of water, and a dead shark. They appeared in mid-air, and they landed in a heap in between Tiffany and the Queen. But a Pixie is always ready for a fight, and they bounced, rolled, and came up, drawing their swords and shaking seawater out of their hair. Oh, it's you, is it? said Rob anybody, glaring up at the Queen. Face to face with you at last, you blouse, you old Kaliak that you are. You cannot come here, understand? Be off with you. Are you going to go quietly? The queen stamped heavily on him. When she took her foot away, only the top of his head was visible from the turf. Well, are ye? He said, pulling himself out of the ground as if nothing had happened. I don't want to have to lose my temper with ya, and it's no good sending your pets against us, cause ye can, we can take them to the cleaners. He turned to Tiffany, who hadn't moved. You just leave this to us, Kaelda. Us and the queen, we go way back. The queen snapped her fingers. Always leaping into things that you don't understand, she hissed. So can you face these? Every Knack McFeagle sword suddenly glowed blue. Back in the crowd of eerily lit pixies, excuse me, a voice that sounded very much like that of Daft Wooly said, Oh, we're in real trouble now. Three figures appeared in the air, a little ways away. The middle one, Tiffany saw, had a long red gown, a strange long wig, and black tights with buckles on his shoes. And the others just looked like ordinary men. It seemed like in ordinary gray suits. Oh, you're a hard woman, Quinn, said William the Gonigal, to set lawyers onto us. See the one on the left there? said one pixie. He's got a briefcase. It's a briefcase. Oh, whaley, whaley, a briefcase. Whaley. Reluctantly, a step at a time, pressing together in terror, the Knack MacFeagle began to back away. Oh, whaley, whaley, he's snapping the clasps groaned Daft Wooly. Whaley, 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 tis the sound of doom when a lawyer does that. Mr. Rob anybody, Fiegel and sundry others, said one of the figures in a dreadful voice. Oh, there's nobody here of that name. We didn't know anything, said Rob anybody. We have here a list of criminal and civil charges totaling 19,763 separate offenses. 
we was not there, yelled Rob anybody desperately. Isn't that right, lads? Including more than 2,000 cases of making an affray, causing a public nuisance, being found drunk, being found very drunk, using offensive language, taking into account 97 counts of using language that was probably offensive if anyone else was able to understand it. Coming a breach of the peace, committing a breach of the peace, malicious lingering. No, it's mistaken identity, shouted Rob anybody. It's no our fault. We was only standing there uh, and someone else did it and run away. Grand theft, petty theft, burglary, housebreaking, loitering with intent to commit a felony. We was misunderstood when we was bands, yelled Rob anybody. You're only picking on us because we're blue. We always get blamed for everything. The police hit us. We wasn't even in the country. But to groans from the cowering pixies, one of the lawyers produced a big roll of paper from his briefcase. He cleared his throat and read out, <clears throat> Angus, big, Angus, not as big as big Angus, Angus, we, Archie, big, Archie, one-eyed, Archie, we mad. No, oh, they've got our names, sobbed Daft Wooly. They've got our names. Oh, it's the prison who's for us now. Objection. I move for a writ of habeas corpus, said a small voice, and I enter a plea of this nefasium cap capite replentum without prejudice. There was absolute silence for a moment. Rob anybody turned to look at the frightened Nack McFeagal and said, Okay, which one of you said that? The toad crawled out of the crowd and sighed. <sighs> it suddenly came all back to me. I remember what I was now. The legal language brought it all back. I'm a toad now, but... And he swallowed hard. Once I was a lawyer. And this, people, is illegal. These charges are a complete issue of tissue of lies based on hearsay evidence. He raised yellow eyes toward the Queen's lawyers. I further move that this case be adjourned, sign die, on the basis of protest non matter tua suere amice. The lawyers had pulled large books out of nowhere, and they were thumbing through it hastily. We're not familiar with counsel's terminology, one of them said. Oh, they're sweating, said Rob anybody. You mean, we can have lawyers on our side too? Yes, of course, said the toad. You may have defense lawyers. Defense, said Rob anybody. Are you telling me we could get away with it because of a tissue of lies? Certainly, said the toad. And with all the treasure you've stolen, you can pay enough to be very, very innocent indeed. My fee will be. He gulped as a dozen glowing swords were swung toward him. Oh, I've just remembered why that fairy godmother turned me into the toad, <laughs> he said. So, um, under the circumstances, I'll take this case pro bono publico. The swords didn't move. That means for free, said the toad. Oh, right, we like the sound of that, said Rob anybody, to the sound of swords being sheathed. How come you're a lawyer and a toad? Oh, well, it was a bit of an argument, said the toad. A fairy godmother gave my client three wishes. You know, the usual health, wealth, happiness package. And when my client woke up one wet morning and didn't feel particularly happy, well, she got me to bring an action suit for breach of contract. It was a definite first in the history of fairy godmothering. Unfortunately, as it turned out, so was turning the client into a small hand mirror and her lawyer, as you now see before you, into a toad. I think the worst part was when the judge applauded. I mean, that was just hurtful, in my opinion. But you can still remember all that legal stuff. Good, said Rob anybody, and he glared at the other lawyers. Hey, yous, you scunners. We got a cheap lawyer and we're not afraid to use him. The other lawyers were pulling more and more paperwork out of the air now. They looked worried and a little frightened. Rob anybody's eyes gleamed as he watched them. What does that visnifacium stuff mean, my learned friends? Visnifacium capite repletum, said the toad. 
well, it was the best I could do in a hurry, but it means approximately, he gave a little cough. <clears throat> would you like a face which is full of head? And to think we didn't a no legal talking was that simple, said Rob anybody. Oh, ho, ho, we could all be lawyers, lads, if we knew the fancy words. Let's get em. The Knack McFeagal could change mood on a moment, especially when there was a battle cry. So they raised their swords up in the air. Twelve hundred angry men, they shouted. Nay, more courtroom drama. We have the law on our side. The law made to take care of rascals. No, said the queen, and she waved her hand. Lawyers and pixies faded away. There was just her and Tiffany facing one another on the turf at dawn, wind hissing around the stones. What have you done with them? shouted Tiffany. They're around somewhere, said the queen airily. I mean, it's all dreams anyway. Dreams within re dreams. You can't rely on anything, little girl. Nothing is real. Nothing lasts. Everything goes. All you can do is learn to dream. And it's much too late for that. And I've had longer to learn. Tiffany wasn't sure which of her thoughts was operating now. She was tired. She felt as though she was watching herself from above and a little bit behind. She saw herself set her boots firmly on the turf. And then, and then, like someone rising from the clouds of a sleep, she fell deep, deep time below her. She sensed the breath of the downs and the distant roar of the ancient, ancient seas trapped in millions of tiny shells. She thought of Granny aching under the turf, becoming part of the chalk again, part of the land under wave. She felt as if huge wheels of time and stars were turning slowly around her. She opened her eyes, and then, somewhere inside, she opened her eyes again. She heard the grass growing, the sound of worms below the turf, and she could feel the thousands of little lives all around her, smell the scents of the breeze, and see every shade of night. The wheels of stars and years, space and time, all locked into place, and she knew exactly where she was, and who she was, and what she was. She swung a hand. The queen tried to stop her, but she might as well have tried to stop a wheel of years. Tiffany's hand caught her face and knocked her to her feet. Now I know why I never cried for Granny, said Tiffany. She never left me. She leaned down and centuries bent with her. The secret is not to dream, she said. The secret is to wake up. Waking up is harder, but I have woken up and I am real. I know where I come from. I know where I'm going. You cannot fool me anymore or touch me or anything that's mine. I'll never be like this again, she thought as she saw the terror in the queen's face. I'll never again feel as tall as the sky and as old as the hills and as strong as the sea. I've been given something for a while, and the price of that is that now I have to give it back. And the reward is giving it back, too. No human can live like this. You could spend a day looking at a flower to see how wonderful it is, but that wouldn't get the milking done. No wonder we dream our way through our lives. To be awake, to see it as it really is, well, no one could stand that for very long. She took a deep breath and picked the queen up. She was aware of things happening, of dreams roaring around her, but they did not affect her. She was real. She was awake, more awake than she had ever been. She had to concentrate, even to think against the storm of sensations pouring into her mind. The queen was as light as a baby and changed shape madly in Tiffany's arms. Monsters, mixed up beasts, things with claws and tentacles. But at last, she was small and gray, like a little monkey with a large head and blue eyes and a little downy chest that went up and down as she panted. She reached the stones. The arch still stood. It was never down, Tiffany thought. The queen had no strength, no magic, just one little trick, the worst one. Stay away from here, Tiffany said. You never come back. You never touch what is mine. And then, 
because that little thing was so weak and baby-like, she added. But I do hope that there's someone who will cry for you. And I hope that the king comes back. You pity me? Growled that thing that had become the queen. Yes, a little bit, said Tiffany. But don't count on it. And she put the creature down. It scampered across the snow of fairyland, turned, and became the beautiful queen again. You won't win, said the queen. There's always a way. People dream. Sometimes we waken, said Tiffany, and don't come back, or there will be a reckoning. She concentrated, and now the stones framed nothing more or less than the country beyond. I shall have to find a way of sealing that, said her third thoughts, or her twentieth thoughts, maybe. Her head was full of thoughts. She managed to walk a little way, and then she sat down, hugging her knees. Imagine getting stuck like this, she thought. You'd have to wear earplugs and nose plugs and a big black hood over your head, and you'd still hear and see too much. She closed her eyes, and then she closed them again, and she felt it all draining away. It was like falling asleep, sliding from that strange, wide awakeness into just normal, everyday being awake. It felt as if everything was blurred and muffled. Well, this is how we always feel, she thought. We just sleepwalk through our lives, because how could we possibly live if we were ever this awake? Someone tapped her on the boot. <laughs>